Day two of the dig at Tel Ako. It is July 27th, 2010. The Tel is very different now. When we started, what we saw was a weed-filled top of a hill. And we had to break that ground. It looked like any messy farm field in kind of miniature. When I first saw it, I wasn't actually impressed all that much. I also didn't think it felt very romantic at all. And I also knew that this was gonna be the hardest physical labor I had ever attempted in my life. I don't even garden. I started the very first year that it was advertised, but it wasn't because I saw the advertisement. I am friends with Tammy Schneider. And she said, well, why don't you come along? And so as a lark, I went the first year just to show people that I could do it. And then I got hooked and I've gone every year since. The Akko excavation started because Ann Killebrew worked at Akko when uh, there was a first series of excavations in the 1970s and the 80s. And so she wanted to develop an excavation that the research agenda aligned with an ability to incorporate the previous excavations. And she also felt very strongly that we needed to incorporate all the cutting edge forms of technology and multiple approaches towards excavation so that it was bringing previous data to light in a cutting edge context. How did I get connected with Akko? Well, I happened to be sitting precisely in the office where I am right now. And Tammy had mentioned to me that she was thinking of starting up this new project in Akko. And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity for me to actually get some experience in field archeology. span So I joined her in 2010 and I thought, you know, I'll do this for two, three years and that's the end of it. Well, nine, 10 years now <clears throat> later, uh, I'm still doing it, still very much involved uh, and still loving the project as much as I did from day one. Good afternoon, everybody, to our second official staff meeting. We have a really exciting week coming up. We have a visitor's welcome day on Friday. Oh, wow. And we're gonna have guides speaking Arabic and Hebrew and English. Maybe I'll even recruit a couple of you to help out, we'll see. The site where we are digging Tel Aka was a Phoenician site. What we don't have any evidence for, at least not currently, is any indication of either the presence of or the influence or connections with Israelite society at Tel Aka specifically. But nonetheless, Aka was, in its time, second, first millennium BCE, one of the most important maritime centers of the Eastern Mediterranean. The Tel, which is the archaeological site where we are excavating, is now about a kilometer or so inland. And where we are excavating, we have really from the Hellenistic period, which is third, fourth century, up until about the seventh century before the Common Era. Um, last season, we got to the ninth, 10th century, which is great stuff. Um, and so we're very excited. And of course, the great thing about archaeology is you never know what you're going to find. It is now about 5.20 in the morning, and we are getting ready to get on the bus that will take us to our excavation site at Tel Akko. And once we get there, we will uh, begin to set up for the day, begin to do some general cleaning, and then uh, get everybody into the squares and start excavating. Area Z is going to go back to Area Z because it doesn't take very long to put up your shades. And then everybody else... Survey! Survey says survey! It's challenging because it is very physically strenuous. Right? You're out in the field for seven, eight hours a day. It is hot, it is dirty, and it is also a tremendous amount of fun. Perhaps the most difficult aspect, at least for me, of being on the tell was just the exhaustion. Uh, we're up every morning before five. We're leaving by 5.25 in the morning, and then we work manual labor type work, the actual digging until 12.30. It's tough work, and it's like labor intensive, but it's really rewarding as well. You gotta make sure you get to bed early. The first days were cleaning up the site, so we had to 
you know, get rid of all the sandbags that were there. On the tell itself, a lot of the time, really is just moving dirt. There's a lot of sweeping. There's a lot of sweeping. A lot of sweeping. You're digging, you're measuring, you're setting up lines so you can know if you're digging straight. Well, this was the question, right? What, did Ashurbani Paul actually come here and do something, right? Or did he just destroy a pseudo-destroyed city? Going through an archaeological dig, you were going down through various layers, and as you were doing so, you are removing and essentially destroying the layers that are above that can never be replaced. And the only way that you can hope to gain some kind of scientific control over the work that you're doing is by documenting each and everything that you do and each and everything that you extract from the ground. There's an archaeological rule that I learned the first year I was there, and it was objects out of context are meaningless, which means simply is if somebody finds a full pottery temple with actual working gods inside in a wheelbarrow, we don't know what strata it came from, and it becomes meaningless. We can make no claims for it. That's why we keep such careful record. And I thought that was a great thing to keep me from doing something careless, and then I realized that is the hallmark of historical research, no matter what field you do it in. Out of context, facts, items, passages of text, things lose their meaning. And so, in many ways, I think it's a way to think through the methods and the theories that we're taught in cultural studies, in history, in archival studies, in museum studies, about the kinds of things we treat as evidence and the kinds of things that we treat as important uh, indicators of a culture. So often, we look at religion as its own separate phenomenon and forget that actually religion is intricately connected with culture and with society and with economics and all of the other forces that make a community or that make a people or a city. And so coming and looking at a civilization that has left us nearly no records, but looking just at the material culture that's left and figuring out how do they work with these remnants, what, what do these remnants mean? I think that ties well into religious studies because a lot of times we're looking at religious studies and we are looking at remnants of ideologies or remnants of cultural practices. And so in a sense, in religious studies, we do a little bit of archeology span as well. What are, these, what are these remnants meaning? How are they being interpreted? How is society using them? Students like to find stuff, little things. The first thing um, you find is a ton of pottery. It's the most ubiquitous find at any archeological site in the Middle East. Oh, guys, she is a beauty. This summer, for reasons that I'm sure we will figure out, we found a ton of figurines. We just kept pulling out figurine after figurine. I found a horse head, which was looked like a horse head about that big. Somebody had dug far enough that I could see this little juglet. I was able to chisel away, brush away, to get it to the point where all of a sudden it just popped right out and fell right into my hands. And it was all intact. We found a complete storage jar that is about, oh, yay big. This was the first complete storage jar that we have found during this excavation in the past 10 years. I found two special finds during my time there. Uh, the first was a bronze ring, and then the second was a stone spindle whorl. It's just a loom weight, so it's like a little triangle made out of stone. Um, and then what was even more amazing is that when we went to actually go to a museum in, in Jerusalem, we were able to see a lot of the finds there, and one of the finds in the museum was the loom. At four o'clock, we wash pottery until six o'clock. And yes, we wash pottery for two hours straight. People hang out, they talk, they bring music. I like to sit in my corner and listen to my oldies music. Just like my dishes are different than the dishes that my mother purchased versus my grandmother, so too in the ancient world, the same thing happened. And so actually we can get a better notion of 
what date on any particular level was active based on the pottery assemblage. So a lot of people think that carbon-14 dating is scientific and therefore the be-all and end-all and that will give you a specific date. But in the periods in which we're working, carbon-14 dating, A, if you can find something that can be data, right, it has to be something that emits carbon and therefore it has to be something that was alive, right, so it has to be wood or olives or something which we don't always find. And carbon-14 dating is, is expensive. We don't just dig in ACO. We also actually run a series of courses within the ACO program. The lectures are on a wide variety of topics, on archaeology, on history, on contemporary Israeli culture and politics, uh, from the faculty and staff of the excavation, and also from outside experts as well. As I tell the students, we have, over the course of the summer, I don't know, 20, 30 lectures. I mean, basically what the students get is a complete semester's worth of lectures and talks and information that they would never have been able to get back here in Claremont. So Anne said we're digging for five years more max, um, and that'll be 15 years, and um, the thing is we're just starting to get to the good Phoenician stuff that Anne and I have wanted to be digging all along. Once we are finished, and once we are done with all the artifacts, and we have removed all the debris that we wanted to, and we've uncovered all the walls and stones that we have found. How do we preserve this? How are we going to make this site accessible to the general public? So that they can say, this is part of who we are as the residents of Akko. This is part of our shared past. Here we are exploring a site of ancient civilization and the human interaction was there, but there's still human interaction in Tel Akko, and that's all the friendships that we get to build there. Not only are you able to look at an ancient civilization and how they approach the world, but you, you have this chance to step inside of another people's modern world and see what life is like for them. You will gain a strength from visiting with the culture, actually walking the roads. I just think it, it may be just a microcosm of the kind of work that we're hoping we can always produce in a place that wants to work on ideas that matter. We can't stop now.